one of the fun things I enjoy is that if I'm watching a season of something, usually at the beginning of that season, they'll do a quick recap of what happened in the previous season. Well, in this nugget, we're gonna focus on DHCP relay testing and verification. So let's do a really quick summary of what we set up and configured in our previous nugget. Number one, we have DC NUG with a DHCP scope supporting the 10 network. That's set up and configured. We set up routing on server two. So it will be willing to route between the 10 network and the 192.168.1 network. And we also enabled the DHCP relay agent to be listening on interface ethernet one. And that's where we left it. So as far as testing for you and I goes, let's go ahead and use as far as tools, we have a client machine that's sitting up on the 10.00 network. It is client two dash nug. So what we can do is we can go ahead and tell it to use a dynamically learned IP address and DNS server, which should trigger the Dora process on the local network. And if the relay is working, it will relay that information back to the server, at which point the server should respond to those messages. And then server two acting kind of like a DHCP proxy is gonna interact with client two to pass on those messages. So here between DC NUG and server two, it's gonna be unicast. And from an IP perspective, that means we have a specific source address and a specific destination address. And the traffic between client two and the DHCP relay is going to be broadcast based. Also, it's interesting to note, and I wanted to pass this along as a tip as well, is that when server two does send those over to DC NUG, the discover and the request, which are both going in that direction from server two over to the DHCP server, because the request is coming off the relay agent on ethernet one, for a source IP address for those two packets, it's gonna use the source IP address of 10.0.0.102. And when the server responds back with the offer and the acknowledgement, DC Nug is gonna send those back to the same address of 10.0.0.102. So the unicast packets will be between 192.168.1.100 and 10.0.0.102. And those four messages as they happen up here between the relay agent and the client are all gonna have the destination address of a broadcast. As we saw earlier in the normal process for discover offer request acknowledgement. So just to reaffirm up here, we're looking at broadcast traffic and over here, we're looking at unicast traffic. I also wanted to point out one field specifically inside of a DHCP message. And that is a field called G-I-A-D-D-R. And in that field, what the DHCP relay agent is going to do, it's gonna put its source IP address where it heard the discover message coming from the client in that field. So the IP packet is gonna be sourced from 10.0.0.102 as it gets sent to DC NUG, and also the GIADDR field is gonna be set to 10.0.0.102. And the question may come up, well, Keith, that's fascinating, but why do we care? The reason we care is the DHCP server is looking at that field to determine which scope to use to hand out an IP address. Because at this point, the DHCP server has two scopes, one for the 192 network and one for the 10 network. And what the DHCP server needs to do when it does its offer, it needs to offer an IP address from the correct scope. So the GIADDR field is gonna have the relay agent's IP address. In this example, it's 10.0.0.102. And that's the significant clue to the DHCP server regarding which scope to pull from, one that matches the network address portion of where that relay heard the message. So now that we know that, I also think it might be handy if as one of our tools, we did some packet captures and that way, as we look at this together and as you do the lab, you can actually prove what's happening and see what's happening with a protocol analyzer. So I've got Wireshark installed on both DC NUG and on server two. So I thought we'd do this. Let's capture the E1 interface traffic on server two and we'll capture the only interface on DC NUG that it has, its traffic here from a Wireshark perspective. And then we can look at all the traffic, the DHCP traffic that's happening up here between the relay and the client, and also we'll be able to see all the traffic between DC NUG and server two. So in the lab environment, I'm gonna go ahead and do several things. I'm gonna make sure that client one and client two are powered up. And then we'll also go to DC NUG and server two, and we'll start the captures. So I've taken the liberty of powering on client one and client two. And while those are powering up, I'm gonna go here to DC dash NUG which is acting as our DHCP server, and let's start a Wireshark packet capture. We can do that by clicking on the little shark fin in the taskbar representing Wireshark, and then give that a few moments to initialize. And now we'll simply double click on Ethernet zero to start the capture. Next, let's go over to server two and start our packet capture there. 
So we've logged on to server two, and on server two, we wanna capture the traffic on ethernet one. That's where the 10 network is connected. So let's click on the shark fin in the taskbar to represent Wireshark. We'll give that a moment to initialize. And here on server two, we're gonna choose the ethernet one interface by double clicking on it. And now that we're capturing there, let's go ahead and jump on client two that's up on the 10 network. So here we're sitting at client two and I thought to myself, self, what can I do when you and I go through this nugget together to make it really clear and obvious from the screen that we're sitting at client two? So up in the upper right hand corner, I've got the name of this machine, client2-nug, and we would select this in the lab environment over on the right hand side, it has the same name. I also put a graphic of the topology and having circled client two to represent that we are sitting at client two. So what we wanna do is go into client two, go to the network properties, and we'll tell it to be a DHCP client. And an easy way to do that is simply right here on client two is to right click on the windows icon in the bottom left hand corner. And from the menu, let's go up to network connections and click on network connections. And then we'll right click on ethernet one. And then from the drop down, select properties of ethernet one. Then we'll go ahead and double click on the internet protocol version four, or you can highlight it and click on properties. Either way works great. And then we'll train this machine to be a DHCP client by clicking the radio button that says obtain an IP address automatically. And while you're at it, go ahead and use the DNS server that you're gonna receive as an option automatically. So with those two radio buttons selected, we'll go ahead and click OK. And then we'll go ahead and click Close. So let's run some commands on the local client to see what currently is happening with that client. Now, there are several ways we could do it. We could open up a command prompt or we could use the PowerShell scripting environment. I'm gonna use the PowerShell scripting environment just because it's visually, from a learning perspective, easier to see the commands. So let me resize this window just a little bit. And in the output below, I'm gonna do a CD backslash just to give us a little bit more real estate and a clear screen. Or we could use the squeegee as well for that purpose. And then let's go ahead and do an IP config. And with the cursor at the end of that row, let's hit F8. And let's scroll up through the output. Let me resize this a little bit. This indicates that our ethernet adapter, ethernet one, this bad boy right there, has an address that is in the 169 range, which is representing a private IP address assignment, not good. This is when a computer being trained to get an IP address dynamically tries, fails, and then says, well, as a last ditch effort, maybe I can join my friends on the 169 network. And the only other friends on a 169 network are also friends that have failed the DHCP process in getting an IP address automatically. So that's a bad sign right there, being on 169. Now, fortunately, we have some tools that we could use to go and verify what's going on, including our packet captures. So let's take a moment and walk through the pieces. From a verification perspective, we could verify that we have a scope on DC NUG. We could verify that we have routing set up on server two and that the DHCP relay agent is set up and listening on ethernet one. And also, if we take a look at the configuration for the relay agent, it will also show us the number of packets. For example, the requests that came in regarding DHCP. And of course, we could also look at the packet captures. And so when you do this lab, <laughs> you can choose any or all of those to look at. Let's do this. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Wireshark captures first. And let's look at those up here on this ethernet segment that we captured on E1 on server two. And we'll do that by going directly over to server two to take a look at that packet capture. So here on server two, I'm gonna go ahead and click on stop to stop the capture. And let's do a display filter by putting our mouse right there, clicking there, and then typing in boot P. From a Wireshark perspective, that's gonna filter and show us all of the DHCP traffic. So with a click there in the display filter area, we'll type in boot P and press enter. And let's make this a little bit bigger. And I'm gonna leave a little bit of space over here so we can see the name of this server that we're connected to. So when you're doing this in the lab and you're walking through it, you can be visually reminded of exactly which server, which device we're on. In this list of packets, oh my gosh, it's not that the client didn't try, look at this, the client tried and tried and tried and tried, discover, 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 hello, 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 and not getting any response back. And if we take a look at one of these discovers, and when you do the lab, the actual packet numbering here on the far left and the timestamps may be slightly different because it's based on real-time traffic when you run this, but the results are gonna be very similar in the fact that we have a whole bunch of discovers that are not being responded to. So here on server two, I don't need the actual details down here on the bottom, so I'm gonna click on view and then deselect packet bytes just to give us a little bit more real estate for the first two panes here. And then with any one of these packets selected, we could expand each of these sections right here. But here's the basic story. The source address is the layer two address 
that ends in C2. And if you're wondering, hey Keith, did you hard code that MAC address on client two so it ended in the last two characters of C2? If that's what you're thinking, you're absolutely right. I wanna make it really easy as you go through the packet decodes if you wanna do that to be able to tell who's who. So client two has the MAC address ending in C2 and he's sending that out to a layer two broadcast which also corresponds to the layer three broadcast address of 255, et cetera. And he's asking for help. He's doing a discover, trying to get a DHCP server or something that looks like a DHCP server to respond with an offer. So at this point, the problem could be that the DHCP relay agent isn't working correctly. Maybe we forgot to tell the DHCP relay agent where the DHCP server was, or maybe we forgot to tell the DHCP relay agent which interface to pay attention to and listen on. And both of those configuration items we did in the previous nugget. Another challenge could be DC nug. Maybe the scope isn't working or maybe it's not active. At which point, if server two is sending these discover messages unicast over to DC nug, the DHCP server, if he's receiving them, but doesn't have an active scope, that could be another reason. An easy way for you and I to verify the communication path and the messages being sent back and forth between server two and DC nug is to take a look at the packet capture on DC nug. It's still running. In fact, let's go take a look at it right now. So here on DC Nug, let's go ahead and stop the capture here as well. And we'll also create a display filter just looking for DHCP related traffic. So we'll go ahead and click in the display filter area and type in boot P and press enter. And look at that. Okay, well, great. This, this basically means that we have a discover packet right here, our very first one on the list that was sourced from 10.0.0.102 which is the DHCP relay interface enabled over on server two. And it's sending the DHCP discover that it got from the client. It's sending it unicast over to the DHCP server address of dc-nug at dot 100 on the 192.168.1 network. Well, that looks great. Also what's promising is that we have a response. Here in my output here, the next packet is a DHCP offer. And if we wanna see what was being offered, we can click on that offer packet and with the offer packet highlighted, we can expand the payload information down here. And here's the IP address that is being offered. The DHCP server is saying basically, hey, I got this IP address, 10.0.0.125. And if we scroll down, here's a boatload of options associated with it, including the default gateway and the DNS server to use and so forth. So the offer is being sourced from the IP address of the dc nug DHCP server. It's being sent back to the IP address of 10.0.0.102, which is the DHCP relay address. And the question is, why isn't that working? Because the DHCP relay should take that and say, great, I'll broadcast this back to the client and continue the conversation. But when we looked at the captures up on the 10 network, there were no offers to be seen, not even one. And the reason that this DHCP relay configuration that's currently in place isn't working correctly is routing. Plain and simple IPv4 routing. Let me explain why. dc nug knows about the 192.168.1 network because it is directly connected to that network. Ta-da, I know how to reach it, it says. It also knows about the default gateways address, which is dot one. So anytime it sends a packet to a network other than 192.168.1, unless it has that in its routing table, it's gonna go ahead and use its default gateway. So in our example, it's trying to send a packet to 10.0.0.102, the IP address on this interface right here. However, because dc nug doesn't have a route to the 10.0.0 network, it sends it to the default gateway, and then the default gateway has to deal with that and forward it. And because this default gateway also has no clue about our private 10 network up here hiding behind server two, and also because private IP address space like 10 and 172.16 and so forth are not routable on the internet, the packet, even if it was tried to be routed this direction, the service providers are gonna go ahead and kill it. They're gonna stop it from proceeding out to the public internet. And that's if this router right here didn't stop it from proceeding out to the internet. And we can verify that from the packet capture along with a little help from ARP right there at DC Nug. So let's go back to DC Nug and take a closer look at the offers that DC Nug was making. So here on DC Nug, if we grab one of the offers at layer three, it was sourced from 192.168.1.100 being sent back to 10.0.0.102. But if we look at the layer two information, it was sourced from the MAC address, the layer two address, the hardware address of dc-nug. And I also configured a 01 for the last two characters of his MAC address and it's being sent to this MAC address, this layer two address. So the question is, <laughs> who in the world is dc-nug trying to forward this to at layer two? And the answer is 
This is going to represent the layer 2 address of DC Nug's default gateway. And we can verify that with a really quick ARP-A to take a look at the ARP cache. So if we right click on the Windows icon in the bottom left hand corner and we bring up a command prompt and I'll size this over here so we can see everything. And we do an ARP space A and press enter. Among other things, the ARP A output shows us the dynamically learned layer two addresses that are associated with the IP address. So DC Nug has this IP address, 192.168.1.1, configured as a default gateway. And that maps to, in my lab topology, this MAC address. And if we look at that MAC address and compare it to that MAC address, <laughs> it's the same one. So to solve this, we need to train DCNUG either through a dynamic routing protocol or with a static route on how exactly to reach the 10.0.0 network. And, and looking at our topology, the right way for DCNUG to reach the 10.0.0 network is going to be using .102 as the next hop. And if DCNUG knows to use .102 as the next hop to reach the 10.0.0 network, it's also behind the scenes going to use the appropriate layer two address that's associated with E0 on server two to forward that packet in the direction of 10.0.0. So what we'll do is we'll create a static route on dc-nug. We'll say, dear Mr. dc-nug, to get to the 10.0.0 network, please use .102 as the next hop. And that will move us in the correct direction. So to do that, let's go up to dc-nug. So here on dc-nug, because I've opened a command prompt with administrator privileges, we can add that static route right here. We could also do it through the PowerShell scripting environment. It would take it there as well. And here's the syntax. And before we create a route, let's take a look at the existing routing table with the route print command. And we'll press enter. And if we scroll up a little bit, here's the IPv4 routing table as it currently is. So if we go through the list, there's no specific 10 networks listed. It does have a default route of 0000, 000 and it's going to use the default gateway address 192.168.1.1. Basically, that's the wild card, the last ditch effort if it doesn't know what else to do. And down here under persistent routes, it also only lists the default gateway with that next hop of 192.168.1.1. So we'll press enter a few times and let's add a static route. And the syntax is route space add the network we want to reach, which in our case is 10.0.0.0, a space, the keyword mask, and then the dotted decimal mask regarding that network, which is three octets of a mask, which is 255.255.255.0, space, and let me scooch this over a little bit so we can see the full syntax here. Then we're gonna specify the next hop, which in our case is gonna be the IP address of ethernet zero on server two. And that is 192.168.1.102, space. And then if we wanted to remember this route and keep it as a persistent route across reboots, we're gonna do the dash P, which means please leave this. <laughs> now it means persistent route. Please put it in the routing table and remember it even after a reboot. Because if we forget and we reboot and it forgets that route, all of a sudden our DHCP relay function is not gonna be successful because DC-NUG forgot how to route to the 10.0.0 network. So we'll press enter to enter that route. We'll hit the up arrow key a couple of times, do a route print once again. And here in the output, we have our route to the 10 network with a 24-bit mask. And the next hop is .102. And that's also showing up as a persistent route, which is perfect. All right, so with that in place, let's go ahead and run our captures again. I'm going to click on the little Wireshark fin icon up here near the top left on DC Nug. I'm going to say continue without saving the old capture. And let's also start the capture on server 2. So here on server 2, we'll click on the little fin as well and click on continue without saving to start the new capture and not save the old. And now let's go to client two and we'll bounce the interface. So here on client two, if you still have it open, we can go back to the network connections. If not, you can right click on the windows icon and select network connections to bring it up. And then with ethernet one selected, we'll right click and click on disable. That'll simply disable the interface. And then we'll go ahead and right click and enable it. It's already configured to use DHCP, and this is just going to go ahead and have it start the process. And if we bring up our PowerShell, where we still have our IP config, we can go ahead and run that again. I'm going to squeegee off the bottom part, and with the cursor at the end of IP config, we'll hit F8 to run it again. And check it out. We have an IP address of 10.0.0.125. And what I would have you do as part of the hands-on lab exercise is go ahead back to DC Nug and take a look at DHCP Manager. Look at your current leases that are in place. We're gonna have one for client one and another one from client two. 
both from different scopes. You can also go back and look at the properties of the DHCP relay agent, which will have counters regarding the number of requests it's seen and so forth. And of course, you can also go back and look at the packet captures that we just created. And in fact, to reinforce the idea of that one field, the GIADDR field in the DHCP discover message being sent from server two to DC-NUG, let's go take a look at the packet capture up on DC-NUG. So here on DC-NUG, I'll go ahead and click on stop for the packet capture. Because we had our display filter still in place, it's showing us, <laughs> this is almost too good, it's showing us the exact four messages that went back and forth between DC Nug and the DHCP relay, server two. And if we take a look at any of these server destined packets, like the discover, and we expand the details of that discover message and we scroll down, this, my friend, right here represents the GIADDR, that field in the DHCP packet, which is the relay agent's IP address. So not only was it sourced from that IP address from a layer three perspective with basic IP routing, but also in the payload, it identified in the GIADDR field where it came from. And that's how the DHCP server compared that against its scopes and said, hey, I've got something that starts with 10.0.0. Let me pull something from that. And that's how it chose to make the offer from the appropriate scope. And also while we're at it, I'm gonna jump over to server two and stop the capture there. So here on server two, I'm gonna go ahead and click on stop. And it looks here like we had a little bit of a hyperactive client. We have four discovers that occurred with two different transaction IDs. The first happened like back to back and the next two happened about five seconds apart. So eventually in this output in packet 35, after that fourth discover message that was sent by the client. So in the background, server two is forwarding that over to DC-NUG. Then DC-NUG is sending an offer from itself over to server two. And then what we see here in this packet 36 is the relay agent forwarding that offer as a broadcast on that local network segment for the benefit of client two. So feel free to take some time, have some fun with it. And when you're done, I'll see you in the very next nugget. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.